Hello, and welcome to another episode of Leader Generation. I'm your host, Tessa Berg. Today, we are continuing our three-part series around trends with independent operators. These are independently owned restaurants, and this is in line with the National Restaurant Show coming up on Saturday, May 21st through Tuesday, May 24th. If you want more information on the National Restaurant Show, visit their website at nationalrestaurantshow.com. But today's guest, super excited to hear from her. We have Lori Torres. She is the owner of Mallorca. It is located in downtown Cleveland, right by, if you're like me, a great stopping point before or after Browns games, if you don't like mayhem and you want some really good food. Uh, and then also she is the president of the Cleveland Independence and on the board of, and, uh, and on the board of directors for the Ohio Restaurant Association. So Lori, Thank you so much for joining us today and for being our guest. It is nice to have you. Thank you. So right before this call, we were talking about, you know, your journey through the pandemic and the creativity and resilience we saw from so many independent operators. Tell us a little bit about what that looks like today. What is the largest um, challenges facing your community and what are some of those creative solutions that you see, especially from your lens in the Cleveland Independence being implemented? I, I think that um, obviously, you know, I can give you the obvious answers, which are uh, inflation. It's a huge issue right now. Uh, you know, things are costing uh, double, and I mean double what they were costing before. Um, and we can't raise our prices exponentially to cover those costs. Uh, I think staffing continues to be a problem uh, where before, uh, you know, industry, we, we were, it was kind of taboo to poach one another's employees. You see us not only poaching one another's employees, but you see the big, uh, big, big industry, big uh, operators outside of our industry poaching our employees. So, uh, you know, you, we may lose a chef, not to another restaurant, to, but to Amazon delivery at $35 an hour, which is just unheard of. So that's a huge problem. Um, I think from fine dining, uh, having to kind of recreate yourself, uh, do a lot more to go, uh, and that's become an issue. Uh, you know, there's, there's a plethora of things, but those are some of the main things that, that we face that cause us to have to be more creative every day. Yeah, those are some huge issues. And I know that my work is actually not a sports bar at all. It's more fine dining. I didn't tell you this. Uh, I got engaged to my now husband at my work. Uh, <gasps> That's yeah. so wonderful. Yeah. I love those stories. Yes, it's, it was one of our favorite restaurants when we lived downtown. And we, but the only time I can go there now is before and after brown <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, for, uh, fine that's dining. amazing. Thank you for that. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think that's a beautiful thing for me owning a restaurant that's 26 years old is I always say that the soul of Mallorca is made up of all the joy that's been celebrated here and that um, being a part of people, being allowed to be part of so many people's history and then become a part of ours. That's such a huge thing for me. So thank you for that. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're welcome. And you're absolutely right. Like our favorite part about Mallorca's food is the experience, is going into the restaurant, is sitting down, awesome service. Like everything is just, it really transports you. And so when the pandemic hit, that had to have been a major challenge to now what do we do when so much of why people come to us is about this experience. Like it's awesome food, but it goes so much above and beyond that. Tell me about some of the solutions you put in to kind of keep the spirit of Mallorca alive, even through all those challenging times. You know, that's interesting you say that because I was talking about this with some, someone the other day because you don't, you do have, we do ha did have to, excuse me, tripping over my words. We did have to shift to, to go for a long time to, uh, you know, particularly when we were closed and the only thing you could do was to go. So we had to shift to, to go and we had uh, to see a lot more of our income come in that form, the form of to go. And so to, you had to be really creative in terms of knowing that 
everybody can have food to go, but how do you transport the experience of Mallorca in that to-go box so that it's not just I'm picking up a pot paella and I'm eating at home, but how can we be creative and make it so that when they get that food home, they still feel that Mallorca experience. And for, you know, for us, it was really putting on our thinking caps and thinking in terms of uh, to-go food with flair. And oftentimes we would send personalized notes home that said, you know, if you were here, we may talk about this and we sure miss you or um, putting together to go so that it was more than just a to go meal, but a to go experience and, you know, packaging things like, hey, you take this, this package home, you're going to have your sangria and you're going to have your champagne and we're going to put some little masks in there so you can have like a, a masquerade at home or putting castanets in there so you could celebrate your Spanishness. So it's really being creative. Um, and, you know, we even arranged Zoom calls with people that would make to, you know, larger orders. And we'd say, hey, after you guys are done eating, let's have a quick Zoom so that we can say hi. And tr really trying to transport that experience into that to-go box. But um, otherwise, it's just to-go food like everyone else. And that's really something that I think fine dining experience um, or fine dining restaurants, particularly those who have a history, really do and will have to do going forward is to create more than just my food is online and you can get it, but, but transporting that experience from Mallorca into the home. Yeah, no, those are beautiful solutions. So with that pivot, you know, trying to create something special in a new format, did that impact, um, and even probably the volume of food was impacted, how did that change how you source and order and get supplies to deliver that new kind of Mallorca experience? You know, you really kind of have to, um, where before you could really order a lot more and I, obviously not the food so much because we, we we pride ourselves on fresh seafood and fresh food but you know before you would order a lot more of your ancillary products in large uh, in large in bulk um, and really what the what COVID did is it kind of shifted that because you didn't know from week to week what you were going to use and so you and you also didn't have the um, excess of money that came in from um, selling excess of things. So you really started kind of on demand, more like inventory, like I, I'm going to buy exactly what I need and no more or no less. And that really has actually um, carried forward into um, now, even though the demand for restaurants has increased and, um, you know, we're uh, back to where we were as before, we we still now are looking at it like, you know, that kind of worked for us, that on-demand inventory as opposed to ordering in bulk. So I think um, when suppliers call me and say, hey, we can give you, you know, 2,500 of this instead of 200, I look at it and say, I don't know that that savings is worth the risk of buying that much, not knowing what's going to happen. You know, you're still, we're still, you know, not that I know my work is going to be here for another 26 years. It's just, I don't know how quickly I'm going to have to pivot. And that item that I bought would become moot or unnecessary. And so is it really worth it for me to buy that big bulk amount? So it's changed that, I think, in a lot of ways for not just myself, but when I hear from other independent operators, they, they're saying the same thing. Yeah, no, that is really interesting. So how have your suppliers reacted to that? Like if you shifted more of your on-demand buying online or to like channels that are, are, I guess, better set up for that, or are the same people able to satisfy on-demand? Yeah, I've used basically the same suppliers. And I think that the suppliers really, um, acknowledge that, that, that that was necessary. And some of the ones who were used to selling uh, larger amounts 
during COVID, everybody had to be creative. Everybody had to shift the way that they did their business or else they weren't going to be in business. So if you did have a supplier that said, hey, it's either 2,500 or nothing, then you'd say, okay, well, then I, I'm not going to use you, you know? So you can either sell me a thousand or you can, I'll go to someone else and get a thousand. You know, I'm just, I'm in any, everybody had to shift. I mean, that's just kind of how it was all the way down the line. If I don't want it and I'm not going to buy it, and you're requiring me to buy more than I need, then I'm going to go somewhere else. That's just how it is. And, and, you know, I, you t- we talk about like the, the relationship with have our vendors is very important. That relationship is really important. Knowing that I, you know, I'm going to deal with Dave at, at land and sea and him knowing my business and me knowing his business. And those relationships were crucial during COVID because It was, uh, and even after, because it was easier for me to say, hey, Dave, you know, we've been working together for 25 years. I'm telling you what I need. This is what I need. And we're partners together in, in, in both your business and my business, because if I do well, you do well. And if you do well, I do well. So we're partners. So that relationship made it easier to make those adjustments and say, while we're going through this, I need to make some adjustments in the way that I order. And you know, we've been around long enough that and you want to keep me as a customer when this is all over. So, um, you know, let's, let's work together. And that, you know, again, relationship building is crucial for specifically for times like now or times during COVID when you have to pivot and you have to change the way that you do business. Yeah. I feel like that is a universal truth of the pandemic is we were all experiencing this together. Mm -hmm. And so it was a time where I feel everyone was a little bit more empathetic getting a lot more creative, much more supportive. Were there anything that your partners or vendors did that really wowed you or, or helped in a, in a dramatic way that was unexpected or or maybe just very useful? I mean, I think probably during COVID the, and we were talking about this the other day in a round table, one of the crucial things um, and, and made a huge difference between those that survived and those that struggled was if you had a landlord that worked with you, if you're, you had a good relationship with your landlord and you had a history with that landlord of working together in that lo- landlord said, hey, I know you're struggling. We're all in this together. Let me help you out. That, that in so many cases with so many restaurants was literally the difference between staying open and oftentimes closing. So I was fortunate because I've had the same landlord for 26 years. We have a good relationship with, with each other. And when this all happened, you know, I said to him, we're not having income right now. And he said, well, we're going to, we're going to, we're in this together. And that was a long-term kind of approach for him and for me, because the landlords who weren't like that are the ones who ended up with empty buildings now because their restaurants closed and now they're trying to fill those spaces. And I think the same thing with, you know, with, uh, with suppliers, when, when I would call a supplier and say, I don't want the whole fish. I want half the fish. Is there somebody who can buy the other half of the fish? The suppliers who are willing to say, yeah, you know, let's, let's work on those that to get, let's do that together. Um, Those are the suppliers that I'll continue to work with. And again, they were thinking long-term knowing at a certain point that I was going to order that whole fish again. Yeah. The phrase you just used thinking long-term, I think is a principle that businesses who lived by that survived and businesses who were thinking too short-term either didn't survive or are not doing well right now, like are are struggling um, certainly to recover. Uh, One of the areas where we see people turning more of their attention, given, you know, this long-term view, wanting to have more relationships with their customers is this trend in marketing called D to C, which stands for direct to consumer. And in that, um, you know, food manufacturers and original manufacturers are trying to get closer to people actually buy their products. And it's give, given way to like a bevy of technology. Have you seen any of these technology solutions where you can buy more direct, but it keeps it all in one place? And if so, like, what's your, what's your perspective on that um, trend or those tools? Um, like, like we said before, you know, um, now is not the time to ask an independent operator to learn how to use a new mechanism for getting the things that they need for their restaurant. 
um, long term that may work. So if I know that I'm going to, I need to know for myself right now, because there's too many other things going on with all the other things that I'm dealing with. I need to know that my rep that I've always worked with, who knows what I order, who knows my supply, who knows my standards. I need to know that person's available to me so that I can say to them, I need this, I need that. And they got it. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a place um, for apps, you know, for technology, that's not to say there isn't a place I can speak on, ta on in terms of the independent operator and that we have so many balls in the air that to have to like learn a new technology to order my fish or to order my alcohol is just not something that I want to do. And um, I, um, you know, I have one of my wine distributors who gave me the whole song and dance about this new way that I can order my wine every week. And I was like, that's all well and good. That's another password I have to learn, another app I have to figure out. That means I have to look through a whole catalog. In the That might work for me at three o'clock in the morning when I realize I forgot to order Marsala wine and I whip on there and order some Marsala wine. But it's not something that I wanna do right now. I'm used to that person to person, you know my, what I order, I know what I order, and that's quicker for me. So that's kind of counterintuitive, I think, for the independents. But again, long-term, we're all gonna get there. But right now is the wrong time to introduce that. You can introduce it as a backup, but not as the primary way for me to order. That's just gonna be just too difficult to the extent that I may say, I'm not going to do that at all. I, I'm not, I'm just not going to order that at all. And, and it got, it literally did um, get to that point with that wine distributor where I just didn't order for three weeks because I didn't have time to sit there and figure out the app or whatever. And she finally called and I said, I've just been getting it somewhere else because I can't, I don't want to mess with this. I don't have time to deal with this app that you have. And she said, okay, let's just go back to you ordering directly from me. And now I'm back to ordering from her every week. So again, long term and, and in the background that's good but right now in the foreground you still need to like let your independent operators have their contact person to order their stuff from does that make yeah. sense it definitely makes sense i mean you had solutions you had to be focused on solutions during the pandemic and now you have these new bevy of challenges including you know inflation and staffing what are the solutions that you that you do need to see now to address inflation and staffing challenges that you and the community are facing? So again, we go back to um, thinking long-term or thinking short-term. Okay, so uh, with inflation, the, there's, there's a temptation to go, oh my God, I had to pay you know, twice as much for my vegetables. I had to pay twice as much for my fish. I'm gonna raise my prices. Um, that, but, but that can be in the long-term the death of you, because particularly if you have a reputation, like Mallorca, for example, we have a reputation of being fine dining, but affordable fine dining. So you don't, you can come in and two people can eat a nice meal for, you know, $125 versus the competitors, which might be $300. So I don't want to bastardize my brand by just all of a sudden raising the prices of the food because that's contrary to who we are. And it's also about respect for my customers and respect for the city that I'm in. And that, you know, these people have been coming here for years and I want us to be the restaurant for everyone, not just for people who have the money to, to be able to afford my price hikes. And um, so again, you have to think long-term. We will get through this inflation. As long as I'm breaking even right now, if I can get through this inflation, people will appreciate the fact that I stayed true to who I was. And I thought about long-term what I wanted us to be and the message that I don't want to send the message that if I'm getting to have to pay more, so are you. I want it to be a message that I'm part of the community and that being part of the community means sometimes I have to make a sacrifice so that I can still be here for the community when we get through it. And I hope people will appreciate that in the end. Um, and I think the same thing is true when it's with, with um, employees. I mean, I've had employees here that have literally been part of our family for over 20 years. As a matter of fact, 
most of our employees have been here for over 20 years. Our youngest employee has been here like four years. And, you know, we still call them the newbie. Um, and again, that is because you're always thinking long term. You're always thinking about um, how does it look when you go into a restaurant and you see that same face every time. There, It feels familiar. It feels like home. It feels like, oh my God, I was here 15 years ago and Enrique is still there. That sends a signal to people that this is like a home, that we're like a family, that this is a comfortable place, that the employees are being treated respectfully. They're being treated kindly enough so that they want to stay here. And when they are treated with love, they love the house. And that kind of love emulates into how they um, treat the customer when they come through the door. So, but again, that's a long-term thing. And it can be frustrating sometimes when you're like, um, you know, my, my, my uh, payroll costs are so high and man, it might be better if I could get somebody who was a little cheaper in the kitchen or a little cheaper here. But again, that's, that's, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot by doing that. So again, with the long-term building relationships and that long-term thinking. So I think it's really beautiful how passionate you are about your customers and the experience you're delivering for them and your employees. Do you think all your customers know the sacrifice you're making as a business owner to keep the prices steady, to keep the experience amazing? You know, I don't think all of them do. I mean, I don't, you know, but I, but that's, but it's still, it's part of my brand. It's part of who I am. And by doing all of the things that I'm doing, by having respect for the city, by having respect for the customers, by having respect for my, my, my employees, that emulates in an attitude that you feel when you walk through the door. So do they know directly, oh my God, I know that she paid $40 for that Chilean sea bass and she's only charging me this much. Do they know that? No, but they know the feeling that they get when they come through the door. And that comes from doing all of those things and having that respect, um, th that having that respect for all your vendors, your employees, your customers, your house, your city, that emulates in the attitude that you feel when you come through the door. And I, I, I so do I know that directly they, they appreciate it? No, but I, I can, I sent, I get the sense that they can feel that. That's awesome. How do you share these ideas and inspirational nuggets, especially around retaining staff? I mean, that stat that you have staff that's been there for 20 years is really incredible. Um, how do you share that with other Cleveland independents who right now are, are really struggling to even keep new staff they've just brought on? I mean, I think I'll, I'll, I think that, you know, I, I have a lot of times um, my staff, I will share my staff with other independents, not as employees, but I will say, you know, I, call Jorge, call Enrique, ask them why they've stayed here. Ask them what motivates them to stay in one place. You know, um, what, ask them. Um, we're a different kind of restaurant in the sense that, um, you know, these are employees who know the business. I don't have, you don't have college kids where this is just a stepping stone for them and they don't intend on staying in the business. So I'm fortunate because these are people who are professionals in the business who plan on staying in the business. So they want to make a home here. Um, it's a, it is a little bit more difficult when you have um, that kind of stepping stone, you know, where you just have college kids or high school kids, it is a little bit more difficult. But if you do it right, and you're respectful, and you uh, uh, appreciate the people that work for you, that's going to emulate maybe not in them staying because obviously, they're not going to go get their engineering degree and come back and serve for you. But that's going to emulate in them sending other people to maybe work for you. That's going to emulate in them becoming customers of yours, them sending you customers because of the feeling they got when they work there. So it may, it may not serve your, serve your uh, employment, you know, where you're getting to keep these people for a long time. But if someone works somewhere where they really love it, but they've moved on, they're definitely going to tell people go and work there. That, that place is home that you feel like this, you feel like that. It, there's just, there, nothing negative can come from that uh, respect for your employees and that thinking long-term 
as as you're part of your city that you're in, you're part of that your community, and that that you're more than just a, a restaurant, but that you're a, a place for people to come and celebrate joy, and you're a, a place for your employees to feel like they're home, and you know that that nothing yeah. negative can come from that. Yeah, no, I love that so much of your creativity and the solutions that you've put forward to get through the pandemic and even now through this period of continued pandemic really um, is all based on your values and what's important and what's a priority at Mallorca. Uh, there are so many different trends and different solutions that we see in the independent restaurant space. Do you ever go outside of sort of I mean, it feels like you've created like this beautiful bubble, but how do you like stay up on trends and solutions that's going on outside of Cleveland or outside of independence that also kind of fuels um, or aligns as possible solutions for you that aligns with your values? You know, that's a, one of the things like as a long-term restaurant, it, it, as a restaurant that's been here for a long time, um, you constantly have to be thinking about, I don't want to get the reputation of being my father's restaurant or my grandfather's restaurant. So you really do have to think about maintaining your brand, but expanding your brand as well. So it, just in terms of something simple like the menu, I will never take anything off the menu because if somebody comes who was here 15 years ago and they got that stuffed salmon and it was the best thing they ever ate in their life, it better dark on well be on the menu when they come back 15 years later. So, but but what I can do is I can look at the trends in food that are now, uh, you know, the the people that are going toward organic, the people that are going toward vegan or vegetarian, the people who have gluten, you know, gluten concerns, I can expand my menu. Um, the next generation, there's a huge vegan, you know, vegan and, and, and uh, that that's a huge trend right now. And I hope it's, it's a beautiful trend. Um, and so I have to look at how to take my brand, which is Spanish, and make vegan food. So that's just a simple way at looking at trends in food. Um, other things are to look at things at generationally how people think. So my generation, which I won't tell you what that is, but <laughs> we liked stuff. We liked collecting stuff, getting big houses, having big cars. That was our thing. The next generation, they like experiences. So if I know that about the next generation, how can I take Mallorca and make it into an experience beyond what it is? So creating things like we do wine and dine in the dark, you know, blindfold dining in a, in a pitch dark room, tasting food with your fingers, you know, experiencing wine um, and food in the dark. That's something that young people are like, wow, that's so cool. I want to do that. And so what that does is that brings people that are in that next generation who think of Mallorca as their grandfather's or father's restaurant. And they're like, this isn't my grandfather or father's restaurant at all. They're doing these really trendy, cool things that no one else is doing. Um, you know, we started doing, I know the next generation is big on Harry Potter. That's like a big thing. There's like a cult around Harry Potter. So we do wine and wizardry. So we take the Spanish theme, we put wizardry into it. You know, you always have to be thinking about what the next generation is following, not just the trends in food, but also in the way that that generation thinks, not just, okay, now I'm ordering, I'm going to have vegan food, but what else, what else, not just what food trends there are, but what trends in each generation, what things are important to each generation and how you can pair that with the business that you own. Does that make yeah. sense? Oh, it totally makes sense. I love those ideas. Uh, where do you learn about these trends? Like you, I mean, you hit on it so <laughs> precisely, like what each generation wants or expects, like how do you track that? Do you like listen to podcasts or read reports? No, I mean, listen, you know, you read a lot. You read the business journals. You go to Destination Cleveland. They're always doing studies at Destination Cleveland, traffic studies, uh, you know, that there, there's always stuff like that going on. You know, um, I read the Cranes Business Journal. I read the Wall Street Journal. Um, you know, I, I, I listen I have a daughter who's 26 and a daughter who's 16. The difference is between what those two groups want, you know? And so we literally, I have a 65 year old employee who I call dinner in the show because he's so fascinating. Um, 
I said to her, can you couple, can you pair with him and make some TikToks? So her generation loves the TikTok. So they, they love my 65-year-old employee with my 16-year-old daughter doing TikToks together. So that, again, it takes the Mallorca as being my grandfather's restaurant and makes it like, oh my God, look at this restaurant. They've paired the 65 year old guy doing TikToks with the 16 year old girl and doing these fun and funky kind of TikToks. Um, so, you know, you, you listen to the young people, you maintain the relationship with your older customers. Um, and, but it, it, it's not, you can't sit on your laurels. You can't say, well, we've always been successful. So we'll always be successful because that's just not the case you always have to be reinventing and looking at what's going on generationally with food, with everything. That is great. I am now going to start following you on TikTok so I can see <laughs> TikTok videos. What a fantastic idea. Uh, so we are out of time. Thank you so much for being our guest. If anyone listening wants to get in touch with you, where can they find you? You can either call, you can either uh, email me at lktorres22 at gmail or at mallorcacle.com, uh, or you can call me at 440-463-4192. I answer the phone 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> and Nature of the beast. Yeah. Yeah. And restaurant life is certainly not a nine to five. <laughs> <laughs> Um, before we got on the call, you mentioned that you participated in a roundtable around how to address struggles uh, with the Cranes Business Journal. So for any listeners, whether you're listening to this in April, April 6th is when we we're having this conversation, go ahead to Cleveland Cranes Business and search for that roundtable featuring Lori Torres if you want more ideas and inspiration about how to address the struggles happening today with inflation, staffing, and what any other topics, Lori, that you guys covered in that roundtable? Yeah, basically the struggles that the restaurants are going through and how they're um, how they're coping. Fantastic. Well, thank you again for being a guest. You can listen to all our podcasts at tenlo.com backslash podcasts, or no, backslash leader generation, or just click on the word podcast. And until next time, have a great week.